Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Can't hear you, sir. Don't know what well, well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 347 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Network, 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 yeah. <laughs> Can you tell I'm rehearsing for musical kids? <laughs> Today, recording day is Tuesday. No, 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 it would be 500. And, sorry, sorry, sorry. It would be 346 then because it's Tuesday. Yes. Um, sorry about that. Today is Tuesday, March 26, 2024, and it looks like it's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. It sure warmed up yesterday afternoon, that's for sure. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? and as you can hear with me is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A uh, big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. We have a little nibble for you today, but before we do anything else, let's say good morning to Mr. Grizzly and ask how your mental health is doing today, sir. Well, good morning, sir. Uh, when I wake up, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet, man. I already was up. I got out of bed at six ten. Started to write the thing, did the thing, did a little bit of reading, research. Took the dog out, took her for a walk. She did her morning constitutional. I still haven't. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so <laughs> when I wake up, I'll let you know how I'm doing. All right. Good morning to the kids who have joined us. Pardon me, we'll have a little breakfast here. Thank you for joining me for breakfast. Kit Elaine, Kit Toronto Dan, Kit Linda M, Kit Jen, Kit Bridget, Kit Carol, or is it Carol or Carol? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, let us know. I'm, I'm going to say Carol until I'm told differently. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pronounce it the French way. Oh, Let's see. Can it, yes. Kit Jen, hello, my dear. How are, uh, how are you today? Plus, we have Mike H. Hey, good morning. Nice to see you. Thank you for stopping by. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Ooh, the chat has been active this morning. Kit Tabby G, good uh, morning to you, dear Dan, friend. And don't tell me. <laughs> Kit Vim. I haven't seen it yet because I'm going backwards through the chat. Kit Jim, good morning to you. <laughs> nice to see you. I think there's going to be a surprise waiting for me. And I think that's everyone so far, unless somebody has uh, said something in the last couple of seconds to get their hello. Kit Cassie, there we go. Good morning to you. That's everyone so far. Oh, okay. Kit Toronto Dan's on a yeah. mystery mission. Um, no, <laughs> I haven't had my morning constitutional. He's in it. <laughs> He's doing some research. That's how a lot of anti-vaxxers do their research, right? Reading yes, the phone yes. on the toilet. Yes, yes, definitely doing research. <laughs> All right, kids and cubs. Um, 
uh, I'm I, I'm doing well. I'm excited. I'm excited. I am sore and I am tired, however, mm. uh, because Saturday was a long rehearsal. And, well, s- Sunday wasn't, no, was it Saturday, Sunday? One of them was like almost 12-hour day. I can't remember which one. That was. It was one of them on the uh, week. Yeah, yesterday was uh, relatively short. Thank God. Uh, today is going to be very, very, very long, and we don't start until 5.30. But I mean, there's already people in the theater, right, doing sound and lights and programming and whatnot. So it's 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 pretty much a, almost twenty four seven operation mm-hmm. at this point until we go on. Um, I'm kind of used to getting one day off somewhere along the way before we open. That's not going to happen this time. So um, by the time uh, Wednesday comes, where we're doing our dress rehearsal with audience today, it's just dress rehearsal without audience. Um, I'm either going to be running on pure adrenaline or somewhere between now and Saturday evening show. <laughs> I'm going to crack or snap somewhere. Because, <laughs> oh, man, I'm feeling it. Mm. Uh, my body is like, what are you doing to me, man? <laughs> it's a good hurt, he says. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a really good show. And uh, said it's a rare treat when you get nine performances, all of them sold out. Um, get to perform, getting to perform for a sold out audience is a privilege. Mm. So, or to that, of course, you see there's a new face too because I have to um, be able to get the microphone to stick. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So to I them. tried that once in, in a musical and uh, yeah, to keep my facial hair. And uh, basically, for all three performances at one point. I was in the number with the most vigorous dancing, let's put it that way, and the mic just kept falling off my head the entire time. So there's not one of the three performances that I got to nail vocally because I was always trying to adjust my headset and put mm, it back on yeah. my head. Would throw it for a loop. <laughs> it's like, we need stickier tape. <laughs> or less facial hair. Or less facial hair. So I'm I'm opting for less facial hair because I have not seen a news article about revolutionary re- revolutionary new sticky tape for Broadway mm. actors. So mm. <laughs> crazy Lou. Crazy. Oh, that would well, be difficult to get off. Yeah, that would be difficult mm. to get off. But like, you like you think like really really high grade yeah. medical tape of some kind, <laughs> right? I so mean, every time staples? I go, every time I go to get my my blood drawn, I can never remove that little thingy without ripping out like a whole whack full of hair, right? So, you know, you'd think like they could get that quality. Mm. I guess it doesn't work that much on the face once you got the makeup and you start sweating a bit and exactly yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Anyway, we will use staples, <laughs> gorilla tape. Ah. <laughs> okay, Cassie's asking me if I've got the moves like Jagger. I got the moves like Jagger. I got the moves like Jagger. I got the moves like Jagger. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, kids. We got news today. We got news because, frankly, we didn't deliver a lot of it to you yesterday. We I, I, have, socialized. I have footage of the uh, bridge for those who have not seen it yet. I can uh, I can yeah. put this up. And That's not look. really, it's, but we could put it up. The, uh, there's a tragedy in Baltimore so. where the um, Francis Scott Francis Key, Scott bridge, Key bridge, bridge, yeah. Uh, was hit by a he, if that name ship, rings yeah. a bell he's the person yep if that rings a bell he's the person that wrote the star spangled banner that's correct the bombs bursting in air uh, so yeah. uh, this i'm going to start at the five minute and 27 second mark just before they hit but if we were to back it up a bit you could see that the, the ship loses power three times and restarts its engine just before it gets too close and it you know it, it makes contact and it's about to hit, and you'll watch the whole bridge comes down in a split second. It's it's wild to see. You can see the ship is slowly moving there. It's making contact with the with the post, and yep, there she goes. The whole thing, like wild, dropped onto the ship. I don't. It, I couldn't tell if there are any vehicles on it, and I couldn't oh, see man. vehicles collapsing into the water. But you can see how quickly that happens. Oh um, my! This is this is from uh, obviously a stream stream live at 1 30 in the morning basically so yeah um sure I'll, I'll post a link for those of you who want it's this is i got this off a of twitter feed but uh 
I will copy the link and put it in the chat here if anybody wants to see it. It's about six minutes and 48 seconds. So you can see the, the ship approaching and how it loses power a few times before it uh, before it makes contact. Yeah, so the Washington Post said there's vehicles in the water. Now, just before it hit, you could see trucks passing across, but the trucks looked like they made it all the way across the bridge before contact was made. So I don't know. I don't know. According to USA Today, two people were rescued from the water. One was unharmed and the other is in a very serious condition. At least seven people were believed to be in the water. While it's unclear mm. whether that number includes the two that were rescued. Well, and they might have been vehicles that were on the approach to the bridge because the approach is still intact. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the approach and, and the, um, the parting side, if you will. So, you know, the approach on either side of the bridge is still intact after the span collapse, but because that's concrete up until it hits the metal part. I'm trying to see, I did have a picture here earlier that showed that that was still intact. Let's see if I can find it. And, oh yeah, it's collapsed right on the ship. There's a lot of footage, obviously, and lots and lots of photos. Oh boy, some people are already getting ridiculous about it. But uh, yeah, there was a photo I saw that showed the uh, uh, the approach intact, and you can sort of see it in this in this. Oh yeah, here here we go. I've got a, I've got a photo of it here. So this shows the um, approach intact. And I think it's the same thing at both sides. If you look to the far right-hand side of the screen, here, I'll put it up. You can see right here where the approach is intact on the far right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the approach, and it's the same thing on the other side of the bridge. So it may have been cars that were, you know, zipping along doing 65 miles an hour. So about 130, 120 roughly uh, kilometers. And if you're close to that, there's no way you're going to be able to stop in time. So that mm -hmm. may have been... Uh, how the cars ended up in the water because it didn't look like there was anything on the span at the time of the collapse but i don't know i'm not a highway traffic safety expert so yeah according to um let's see what do we have here according to the u.s coast guard um says they're conducting search and rescue efforts uh, with senior White House officials in touch with Maryland Governor Westmore and Baltimore Mayor Brandon M. Scott to offer any federal assistance they need. And um, the police chief of Baltimore has already come out about 15 minutes ago to say that there was no evidence that the ship collision that caused the collapse of the bridge was intentional. The FBI said it was joining the investigation into the cause of the collision. Rescue queues have determined there are vehicles in the Patapsco River following the bridge collapse. Our sonar has detected the presence of vehicles submerged in the water, said Fire Chief James Wallace. I don't have a count of that yet. They're waiting to make sure that the ship is secure and stable before investigators board it. Mm. And uh, that's pretty much it. No indication of terrorism so far is uh, the claim for because you know as soon as that happens, because we saw it in Canada, because our leader of the opposition did it, as soon as something goes crash or boom, there's already some, there's always somebody willing to rush to a mic and for say it's terrorism. Yeah, yeah so it was a cargo ship, obviously, you can see in that photo. And uh, by the looks of it, it looks, like I said, in, in the, uh, the six and a half minute video, it looks like it was had lost power three times because all the lights go out on the ship three times. And at one point you can see they restart the engine. There's a big puff of smoke that comes out of the stack uh, and then boom, it hits it. So yeah, not, not a terrorist attack. I do not believe it. It looked like to be just a tragic accident by, you know, all measures who, um, wh what the cause was, I don't know. Uh, I mean, no ships get, some of them don't get the maintenance that they deserve because as we discussed in the past with certain uh, companies running trains, they staff them with next to no people so that they can save money. And the people don't have time to do the full inspection of the trains because they've cut their inspection time down to nothing because, mm -hmm. hey, that costs us money and we need to turn a profit for our shareholders, right? Profit, profit, right. profit. I don't know if that is the case here. I'm merely speculating. And I can do mm -hmm. that because... I'm not a journalist. I'm just a guy with a microphone. But exactly. who knows? It, it, it could have been human error. It could have been a mechanical failure. It looked like a mechanical failure. Why? We don't know. So I'm sure mm -hmm. we'll find out at some point in time in the near future as the investigation continues. Yeah. Speaking of things that are uh, terrorist attacks or 
at least alleged to be, uh, over the course of the weekend in Moscow. There was a huge attack at a theater, uh, which initially had Russia claiming that about uh, 130 people had been killed, including three children. Um, there was it wasn't known at first uh, what was the cause um, because there, was, there again there was a lot of speculation. Was it an inside job from Putin to try to gain more sympathy? That was it something that happened shot, right? from Ukraine? Was it something else? Um, the latest numbers are that 190. 239 people were dead and 180 injured. It is the largest and deadliest terrorist attack in Russia in decades. And Russia has uh, observed a day of mourning already. Uh, Russian state media reported that three of the four pleaded guilty and that they come from the former, former Soviet Republic of Tajikistan and were in Russia on temporary or expired visas. Of course, this is Russian state media reports, so... You might have to take that with a grain of salt. I've heard other reports that only two have pleaded guilty. Three of the four were badly beaten when they appeared in court uh, and bruised, and the fourth appeared to be non-responsive. Um, apparently, one of uh, the, the four that appeared in court also had um, was also missing an ear. Um, yeah, I giving heard. the impression that uh, clearly uh, they were put on display in this manner so that other people in Russia could see what will happen to you if you dare a try. He was missing an ear because like a police this. officer pulled out a knife and, and cut it off. And my friend who works in counterterrorism told me he'd seen the footage of that already. Yeah. yeah. Um, ISIS-K took responsibility. It's a group based in Afghanistan that would like to be rid of the Taliban. Yes, the Taliban is their enemy because the Taliban isn't pure and Islamic enough. Yeah. Ponder that for a second. The Taliban is not repressive enough, not ideological enough. Yeah. Hence going to prove the thing that I often say. The problem with ideological movements is that somewhere along the way, when it doesn't have success fast enough, there's another person willing to come along and say, hey, your ideologue is not ideological enough. And now let's take another step to the right or the left, <clears throat> depending, because there are leftist extremists as well. Uh, ISIS-K apparently is extremely angry with Russia for what it did in Syria in support of Bashar al-Assad. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Nobody knows for sure whether it is, in fact, ISIS-K, because the group does have a history of claiming responsibility for things it did not do. And Putin, on his side, is trying to take, take advantage of this, trying to claim that uh, the terrorists were seeking to escape through Ukraine, suggesting, without necessarily outright saying it, although he might have said it by now, that Ukraine probably would have been quite willing to give them help. And he's saying right now that we know who certain, certain of the perpetrators are, but we don't know who the masterminds are. Mm. Oh, those Ukrainians. Putin will claim. Uh, one of the members who pleaded guilty said that he had recently returned to Russia from Turkey and was paid $7,000 to go to the concert hall and start shooting. The United States, now here the, the funny thing is, is that uh, the United States sent Putin an alert earlier this month claiming that extremists were planning to target large gatherings in Moscow. In fact, the United States sent out uh, a bulletin to Americans living in Russia telling them to avoid large gatherings because they had gotten some information that something was afoot. Of course, Putin rejected it, claiming that a uh, the United States is just trying to destabilize Russia. I can understand why Russia would not trust anything that has to come from the United States. Yeah. They are kind of mortal enemies. Mm -hmm. But you know that joke about um, not everybody who... Uh, What's that joke? Not everybody who tries to pull you out of shit is your enemy, <laughs> necessarily. Um, so, 
Yeah. Yes, it seems that the United States was telling the truth, Russia didn't buy it, and then this happened. So when asked on Monday if the assault represented an intelligence service failure, the Kremlin said that Russia's standoff with the West meant intelligence sharing was not happening in the way it used to. Quote, unfortunately, our world shows that no city, no country can be completely immune from the threat of terrorism, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said. Russia's intelligence services worked tirelessly to defend the country, he, he added. Now, of course, this makes it such that there is now two incidences across the world where a leader's country received warnings that something bad was going to happen before something bad happened. And those warnings were not heeded. And then something bad happened. That other leader is Benjamin Netanyahu. Because he did get warning of October 7th. Oh yeah, yeah. That's why everybody's a lot of the extra people that were people that were mad at Netanyahu were even mad more because they were all mad about the whole trying to reform the Supreme Court type thing, so that he could keep his butt out of jail. And then all of a sudden, it was the largest intelligence failure in Israel history. Well, this is the largest intelligence failure in Russia in a damn long time. And both times, the leaders were warned, but they were on an ideological mission to try and eliminate a certain group of people, and mm -hmm. therefore were blinded by their ambition, and left a flank exposed, and their people got hurt. It seems now that Russia has 11 people detained four had appeared in court uh, connection with the attack. They've been charged with terrorism and uh, I believe there was another crime with which they were uh, charged with as well. Um, can't find it off the top of my head. Um, yeah, charges, sorry, of group terrorism causing death, which comes with a maximum sentence of life in prison. There's a lot of people uh, in Russia that are now claiming that maybe they should bring back the death penalty because of this type of thing. Of course, these types of cases always come with a group of people saying, because it's terrorism, right? It's one of the worst possible crimes a human can commit upon other humans. So therefore, you know, it seems like a, a no-brainer. Uh, for people to use those types of calls to bring back uh, those types of events to bring back uh, death penalty calls. So uh, right now, that's what's going on. There's also some uh, claims going on that uh, one of the people involved somehow with this uh, is a member of ISIS-K of uh, Canadian origin. Mm. So um, we just heard that. Uh, I just heard that on the news before coming on. I don't have any further additional details than that. The, the name of the person had been given in the report, but I hadn't had time to uh, note it down. So uh, there'll be a little bit of the intrigue that might be coming uh, Canada's way here on that as a result of that. But uh, yes, we'll keep our eyes peeled because, uh, you know, regardless of what we think of Russia at the moment, and not even so much Russia, just Putin itself. Um, you know, there are uh, one about 140 families mm. that are missing loved ones, and then another, uh, you know, 180 or so that are um, worrying about the health conditions of other people and their family. And that's uh, something we do not want to experience. Thank you very much, and uh, we don't wish on anyone. <sighs> But yeah, lots of, it's uh, easy to get a little depressed. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. It's easy to get a little depressed. Uh, on the immigration front in Canada, um, recently the government of Canada announced that it was putting a cap on foreign students and foreign student visas. Um, and uh, Immigration Minister Mark Miller at the time uh, said that uh, that system was a bit of a mess and it was time to rein it in. And they installed a two-year cap on new study permits for international students, dropping the number of permits by more than a third to approximately 360,000. 
in order to ensure the integrity of the system. At the time, Mark Miller said, it's not the intent of this program to have sham commerce degrees and business degrees that are sitting on top of massage parlors that someone doesn't even go to, and then they come into the province and drive an Uber. And uh, they mentioned that there were tons of problematic schools. It looks like uh, that led to Doug Ford reversing his original decision to reverse former Premier Kathleen Wynne's decision to not certify these types of colleges. Uh, it seems that there were also a lot of donations to the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party that came from people operating these types of colleges. And that's being looked into in its own right. Mm -hmm. uh, the CEO of the National Association of Career Colleges, Michael Sangster, uh, at the time said that, uh, said, we are all a little surprised by the speed of the announcement today. It's a big and drastic measure they've taken. I'm concerned that our members are being labeled as fly by night, which is not the truth, which may be so, but a lot of members are, your members are fly by night. And as an association, you did do enough to self-regulate. So therefore, uh, the federal government had to intervene and it has. Well, that has been one prong of the plan to reduce uh, immigration in certain ways so that our immigration and our housing numbers can match. Because as we've stated often on the show, you don't have to be anti-immigration to notice that with the rate of immigration that we're having, and part of it at the time mm -hmm. was because we did have a worker shortage, especially coming out of COVID. Oh, yes. Uh, so we expanded rules. We allowed a student, uh, international students to work at more places than they were usually allowed to work and for more hours. That has been curtailed as well. Um, but the point is, is that uh, housing was not being built at a rate that could uh, handle both population growth through immigration, mostly because we're not doing it naturally, kids. Well, um, at the rate we're going, within about 10 days, we'll hit 41 million. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to slow that down because we're accelerating the housing builds, but you got to decelerate immigration a little bit. So they're looking at uh, students and uh, the second one, uh, tranche, if you can say, or layer mm -hmm. that they're acting on now is um, temporary foreign workers and temporary foreign residents. So it turns out that according to the census, um, over uh, about 6.2% of the Canadian population are temporary foreign residents. Don't know if you knew that, that was the number. Ooh, so the federal exactly. government is uh, on a plan to reduce that from 6.2% to 5% over the next three years. And they're passing some regulations, for example, reducing the number of foreign workers a business can hire. There will be exemptions, of course, for the agricultural construction healthcare centers, because those are the ones where um, foreign workers are most needed and uh, you know given that we have a housing crisis you can't cut in construction and given that we have a healthcare crisis you can't cut there and given that we all need to eat you can't cut there so <laughs> um and the evidence of the the immigration maybe being a little too strong is even showing up in the jobs numbers where you know last month we created well last job last jobs report indicated that we had created 41,000 jobs but the unemployment rate also still went up 0.1 percent because more people came in. So even though the job growth was absolutely amazing, it still didn't keep pace with population growth. So um, so well, just pulling the brakes gently. I'll give you a for instance here. Um, the population of Ontario on February 28th at um, 8.30 in the morning was 15,951,698. The population of Ontario as of this exact moment in time is 15 million nine hundred and seventy seven thousand one hundred and seventy eight so it's grown by twenty six thousand people in less than 30 days yeah indeed um, the government is also promising to weed out abuse of the program by employers by reviewing how Ottawa issues work permits to so that they're better aligned with labor market needs so there's a um, the work on the housing file um, is happening not only on the construction, but by um, adjusting slightly and gently our immigration levels so that we're at least building at a rate that can keep up with population growth. And then hopefully at some point exceed it so that we can uh, cover the gap. It's probably going to be a 10-year job beginning to end if we keep at it. 
Mm. Nobody comes in somewhere midway. Uh, but of course we can always uh, move faster on that. Uh, if we do have the bodies, our, our problem at the moment is, is the bodies to actually build the houses. We'd have to bring in a whole lot more people to, to go a lot faster. And the people that we bring in, well, they have to be housed while they're here. Yes. No, period. <laughs> and, then, and then you'll have people, well, we have to stop immigration. Do you, do you realize how stupid of a statement that is? Yeah. I mean, if we do that, this country will come to a screeching halt in a matter of weeks. It's simple. It's a simple fact. It's simple math. We don't have the bodies to fill the positions. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that, uh, that when we could fill positions with certain bodies, they don't want to do the work, which is why we have migrant labor. Because people don't want to go out and pick crops in the field. And I understand that. I'm not about to start doing it. I am 55, though, and my body is rather broken. So a young person, a student, who doesn't want to go tree planting could help in farm fields. There's money to be made. Now, are those people paid well? No, it's criminal what they're paid. I'm not going to get into all of that because I don't have any of the numbers in front of me, but I've read some pretty horrible human rights and labor code violations. And, and you can find that stuff online from the government of Ontario as an, as an example, but it's in each province that this occurred. But without migrant labor, crops don't get picked. Fields don't get planted. It's just as simple as that. For certain farms, that now there's, you know, you'll have the big factory farms, which we don't have a ton of in this country. Mm -hmm. in the United States. There are, there's still a number of them for sure, but not, not on, on the same scale. But you understand that with factory farms, a lot of the farming that is done there is fully automated. Right. You know, that's, they, they have a small crew of, of people because it's so much of it is literally fully automated because they have the money to buy the equipment to do that. And you'll have big factories that will come in and buy up small family farms. And I say small family farms, maybe they have 20,000 acres. I don't know. Arbitrary figure which would be small compared to some farms, which are, you know, a million acres, as an example. So, you know, there's they're, they're small family farms that have to hire migrant workers. There's smaller farms that do not have the money to put into fully automating their systems. Not to mention the fact that some of these farms have relied upon multi-generations of migrant workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, 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 you know, continue to employ their families year after year after year. This is, this is all things that have been going on for decades. Oh, um, yeah. I don't know how long, but 50, 60, well, more than 50 years. It's been going on, I think, since the early 60s when the, the first wave of Jamaican migrants came to Canada to help. And a great number of them decided, you know, we kind of like it here. And then they experienced the first winter and managed to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I say this all the time, and I say it only partially in jest, because I meet folks all the time who've you know, just recently moved to this country from another part of the world where they don't have the harsh winters that we have. And I'm like, wait a minute, you, you came here from where? And you've been here how long? Three years. And they haven't given you your citizenship yet? And they go, well, no, it's a process. I go, yeah, you, you stayed in Ottawa for three winters and three summers and want to stay here? I think we should just hand you a passport. Because that shows dedication to the country. It's not an easy city to live in year round. It's a wonderful city. I love it here. But for those of you who are coming from a warmer climate, who experience an Ottawa winter and still want to stay, you are dedicated. And I salute you because it's difficult. Now, don't use this past winter as an example of a typical Ottawa winter because it really wasn't. We haven't had a typical Ottawa winter in a few years now. Oh, might that have to do with climate change? Maybe, you think, a little bit? Tiny little bit, maybe. Mm -hmm. Climate change plus El Nino. Exactly. And, and, and look, here's a statement from from our friend Cassie in southern Manitoba, who who is a farmer. Not many Canadians, especially young people, want to work on vegetables fruit farm because the labor is so hard. And it is. It's damn hard work. So I get it. You know, I get it. But don't tell me you can't find a job when there's plenty available. Are they, are they good jobs? No, but it's a job. Getting yourself into the labor market is a start. I understand how difficult it is. I've been unemployed. And I mean, my contract is up in June. 
it, whether it gets renewed or not, it's, it's not up for me. I can't determine that. It's somebody else is pulling the strings on that. Will I find myself unemployed? No, no, because my employer would find more work for me, but I can't go back out into the field, and I told them that. I can't go back out into construction zones and, and building things anymore. My body can't handle it. I'm too old. I'm 10 years from being put out to pasture. Actually, nine and three quarter years, I guess, or nine and a half, less than that. Nine and a third, because I'll be 56 this summer, just a few months away. When is my birthday? July. What, how many months is that? Is it April, May, June. Well, basically four months. Now, not even four months, because it's July 5th. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm basically nine years away from mandatory retirement at 65, which, let's face it, all I'm going to do at 65 is just work a little less. Now, hopefully, by that time, we'll be able to turn this into a full-time gig, and I could not worry about my day job anymore and just do this full time, which would free up more time for me to do more production work. And eventually maybe we could hire some technical support staff. So I would have to worry about less production work <laughs> and just do this sort of thing. But, you know, pipe dreams and plans are all down the road, all down the road. Oh, Carol, your birthday's on Canada Day. That's awesome. That's awesome. You ever been to Ottawa for Canada Day? You really should experience it. If you've never experienced Canada Day in Ottawa, you've never really experienced Canada Day. And that's the truth. That is the truth. I'm working until noon the day of my funeral. Yep, Jim, I, I'm right there with you on that one, buddy. <laughs> All right. Pardon me. <clears throat> yeah, in other news, um, it's a little more international today, kids. Um, with uh, the Israel and uh, Gaza thing, it seems mm -hmm. that there's finally been a motion, non-binding, uh, for a ceasefire that has passed at the United Nations Security Council because the United States finally made good on its threat. We mentioned it last week that the United States had some conversations with Israel, um, with the government of Israel, that uh, if certain things were not going to be done or if they insisted on going down certain paths, that the United States could not necessarily guarantee that it would always use its veto at the mm. UN. And uh, which is something the United States has always pretty much consistently done. Well, it turns out that it, it has happened. Uh, there was a motion presented at the Security Council, and uh, the Security Council has 15 seats. Of course, it has some uh, permanent members like uh, the UK and the United States, Russia and China, and the five permanent members have a veto, and uh, the other t 10 members rotate in on uh, two-year terms to come and sit on uh, on the council. And uh, yes, it passed 14 to 0 with one abstention, which caused um, the government of Israel to not be happy whatsoever. Now, this proposal was passed specifically because currently it is the holy month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Ramadan Mubarak, everyone who is uh, celebrating uh, and observing. And... Uh, so in one way, it's sort of symbolic. They're trying to, you know, say, it's the holy month of Ramadan. Could you not have a ceasefire at least for this month? Yeah. Type thing. Um, the United States didn't vote for it because uh, it said that because the motion did not contain wording that condemned Hamas, it could not. Um, like I mentioned, the government of Israel was not happy about this, and it led them to cancel a planned visit from two uh, top officials that were coming to Washington, D.C. to discuss um, Netanyahu's plans mm -hmm. to um, enter the southern, Gazan city, southern Gaza city of Rafah uh, to try and uh, clear out Hamas there. His position is that, uh, well, we've cleared them out everywhere except for this one last pot, so we have to finish the job. And everybody else is saying, yes, but they've got nowhere else to go and there is no food coming in and we have a starvation crisis and you need to fix a lot of other stuff first. And that ceasefire would allow to organize uh, the distribution of that aid because it's not that there isn't any food. Mm -hmm. There are trucks lined up at the Egyptian border. Oh, yeah, yeah. Full of and food. We've seen them. Just waiting. It's just that uh, Israel is not giving permission and Israel is still denying permission for them uh the, the, that uh, aid to enter through uh, the north of um, Gaza. Um, 
White House uh, spokesperson John Kirby um, stated that this vote from the United States was not a change in U.S. policy whatsoever because the United States had always supported a ceasefire. It was just not able to vote for it at the U.N. because of all the way that the other resolutions were worded, apparently. Um, and uh, Kirby also called the move from the Netanyahu government to cancel that high-level visit perplexing. So we'll see what's going to be happening on that front. On another avenue, it seems that though Canada has been one of the nations that had temporarily put a pause to the UN WRA uh, money, which is the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees and for doing works in there, um, the United States still has not mm. indicated that it would reestablish funding. And the United States is the largest funder at the moment. So that part is uh, still waiting. And on another plank, uh, having to deal with this, Israel has reportedly agreed to a proposed uh, proposal to trade hostages for Palestinian prisoners. The tentative deal does not include a ceasefire, but would release about 700 Palestinian prisoners in exchange for 40 Israeli hostages. The deal still needs to be formally accepted by, accepted by the leader of Hamas, but Israel says it's ready to go on this one. Finally, uh, Canada did start a program three months ago to help Palestinian Canadians bring their extended family members to safety. And although the program allows for a thousand Palestinians to be sponsored because of the status of things being so unsafe in Israel and also Egypt, not cooperating really with letting people in and out, um, only 14 people have been able to make it to Canada so far. Oh, wow. After three months. So, wow, that's a bit of a surprise. Only 14. So, um, but again, when you when you're seeing people um, in Canada protest on the streets, yeah, constant. that's probably one of the reasons because you know they have loved ones out up there and they're not able to get them back soon enough. Mm -hmm. That, of course, does not justify fire bombing synagogues and community centers. Oh, it does and not. One no of the places where the federal that. government is unfortunately failing in this fight is yeah. they're doing pretty well on the international scene, making sure that Canada can still remain as an honest broker and get involved when there needs to be an opportunity. But at home, uh, the government of Canada is not taking a strong enough stand to uh, denounce instances of anti-Semitism here on Canadian soil. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there are instances of anti-Islamophobia as well. <clears throat> And Canada uh, seems to have a policy of not mentioning one without mentioning the other. So it creates for the members of the Jewish community who are looking to see if uh, the government of Canada is indeed on their side. Um, says, Why can't you just denounce something that's happened to us without having to also include a denunciation of Islamophobia? Mm -hmm. Why do you always have to put something else in there? Uh, which is... Uh, uh, causing some uh, consternation. Um, this, of course, is natural and normal because, as we mentioned again on the show, we mentioned it a lot, Canada is a pluralistic country that has about 400,000 Jewish people and about 1.8 million Muslims, and our government has to respond to both of them, which puts them in an unenviable situation, and it would be the same for any government, regardless of the stripe, of trying to keep both groups somewhat happy, which is impossible. Hmm when there's a war between the two groups somewhere else in the world. Oh, yes. It's just impossible. So uh, if you think any other government would be able to do better with this hand of cards, you might be living in dreamland. You could do a whole lot worse, though. Mm. Like going all in for one side in a pluralistic country. Yeah, that Like would be the conservatives worse. have done. That would be worse. If the conservatives were the government right now and they had gone as far in all for Israel as they are now, right now they're the opposition. They've got nothing to lose. They have no one to be accountable to. In Canada, for some reason, we have this strange concept that only the government must be held to account, but the opposition must not for what it does. I personally think that that's incorrect. I think all parties should be held accountable for what they do, whether they have a shot at government, whether they're the government in waiting, whether they are the government, or whether they're not. Mm -hmm call me crazy um, because if that were the case conservatives would be going nowhere because with the amount at which it lies and prevaricates and just makes things up and character assassinates and defames that would be called out every time 
but it isn't. So uh, we'll be waiting for developments there because uh, things are... Um, yee. <laughs> and another part of the world where things are yee is Haiti. And uh, in Haiti, uh, evacuations of Canadians have finally started from Haiti. The government is planning to evacuate any Canadian who has a passport to the Dominican Republic. So they're not uh, taking people from Haiti and bringing them back to Canada. They're just bringing them across the border because the island of Hispanola has two countries, Haiti on one side and Dominican Republic on the other. And Dominican Republic is way safer and way more developed. Yeah, it's, it's a Haiti. stark contrast when you consider it's just like right there. Right? Yeah. They're literally on the same island. Um, and from the Dominican Republic, those will be evacuated, can then find their own way home. The, because of uh, requirements of the government of the Dominican Republic, only Canadians who have a valid passport will be able to book one of those helicopter evacuations. Canadians who do not have a passport are advised to call Global Affairs and obtain a travel document. Uh, 150 Canadians had expressed an interest in leaving Haiti prior, prior to the program being announced. It seems that that has risen to about 300 since it has been announced. Um, Canadians who are in Haiti will have to make their own way to the assembly point, however, which can be treacherous given the chaos in the streets. Canada is looking at uh, access for um, uh, evacuations to other countries that do not have the passport requirement and other to keep families together. According to Minister Melanie Jolie, quote, it is Canada's priority. It is my personal priority not to separate families, and that's why we will be coming up with new options. People with children or medical conditions will be airlifted via Heil helicopter in priority. Uh, 18 people were evacuated, uh, I believe it was on uh, Sunday, maybe Monday. Uh, there was a day, I think yesterday, evacuations were a little harder because weather uh, on the side of the Dominican Republic was not very uh, cooperative. Of the 300 who have asked about assistance getting out, only fewer than 100 are actually eligible, so that might have something to do with travel documents, and fewer than 30 say they can actually leave immediately. So uh, this is something that's going to be a much more of a slow drip. The United States, uh, the U.S. State Department says that on its part, it has managed to evacuate just over 340 American citizens so far by helicopter, uh, but their evacuation program started much earlier uh, than did ours, and of course, they have greater capacity as well. So uh, that's going on there. If you have loved ones uh, in Haiti and you're talking to them and they are looking to get out, please make sure that this information does get to them because uh, the like said, evacuations have indeed started in earnest. Uh, there's lots going on in Trump world. Do we have time for that? You know what? I'm well, I was going to talk about Puff Daddy if you want to talk about that. I have no idea what that is, but I actually have some Canadian news. Oh, okay, sure. Said. But, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, his house was raided apparently in a, in a sex trafficking ring, uh, is the rumor. Oh, yay. Three of his five houses. Um, and his neighbor says he's been known to bring minors on huge buses after midnight, his next-door neighbor. So, I, I don't know, rumor, hearsay, although uh, Cat Williams is in here spilling the tea on that, and Cat Williams has been spilling tea on lots of people, like... He did it on Michael Jackson. He did it on, um, oh, what's his name? Who just got uh, um, R. Kelly. So he's been proven to be right every single time thus far. So it's interesting to see what's going to happen with uh, the investigation that's ongoing. The FBI raided yesterday. So we'll, we'll see oh what boy. happens. We'll yeah. see what happens. Hey, Kid Pete. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, my bud. Lovely to see you here again. He goes, ah, oh, I feel like a celebrity when I pop in here. Ha ha. Hope you lovely people are having a good morning and a salute to Bear and Beaver. Hope you're both well. We are indeed. Although I'm a little pooped. Yeah. But I'm well. Um, hope you are too, buddy. In uh, Back home in Canada, um, our favorite premiere, Mr. Canoe. Is that oh, okay, you were being again. literal there. I thought you were being yes. sarcastic. No, 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 literal, 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 sorry. Yes, sir. There might have been some lingering sarcasm. Yes. <laughs> we have a lot of premieres that we refer to as our favorite in sarcastic tones. Yes, yes, but our literal, our, literally our favorite premiere, Mr. Wab Canoe, has agreed, agreed to a $530 million settlement in child family services lawsuits in the provinces of, in the province of Manitoba. They have agreed to uh, 
repay, they agreed to put $530 million in the fund to repay children in care after 14 years of clawing back federal governments that were supposed to go to them. So basically, uh, the federal government was making payments to the province of Manitoba between 2005 and 2019, and that money was supposed to go to child and family services in the province so that the money could go back to the kids. And from between 2005 to 2019, when I believe it was constantly conservative governments, Manitoba, but I may be wrong, and maybe some of Gary Dewar's time is included in there. Um, uh, the government of Manitoba just took that money and put it in general revenues. Hmm. And just said, screw the kids. Yeah. Um, so I'm very happy for the kids, said um, Trudy Lavallee, who's the executive director of the Animiki Oz Ozoson Child and Family Services. Um, so the amount... Uh, is three hundred thirty-five dollars, three hundred thirty-five million dollars that was clawed back plus interest and damages for discrimination. <clears throat> sorry, I got something in my throat. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Just go ahead, mute, clear, and we can uh, go. reboot. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, they're not fighting it at all. Uh, and yeah, so it did include time with uh, Gary Dewar uh, because in two thousand five, the article says here the then NDP government had child welfare agencies remit the federal benefits to the province saying it was in compliance with the law because it was providing the children in care. Uh, but someone named Elsie Fleet, who was the lead plaintiff for Indigenous Children in Care and the former CEO of the Southern Authority, uh, and she sparked the whole process of recovering that money for kids in care in 2011 when she... If she so this person here, when she was asked if they were being discriminated against by having their federal benefits clawed back, she said, quote, when the province took the money, we had groups of children who had no access to money for things that regular maintenance would not pay. If they wanted to take powwow lessons or were particularly good at hockey, those kinds of expenses. For the province to assume with no agreement, no authority, and no provision in place that they could somehow take this money from the kids, in our opinion, was theft. We're glad the court saw it our way and that the province was wrong. Hmm. Good. 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 This makes, yes, this makes me very, very happy. Because as a, somebody state, a lady named Mona Boers, who I can't tell with whom she's affiliated uh, at the moment, uh, specifically said, this rightfully belongs to them. Some will have bigger settlements than others, depending on how many years they've been in our system. The main difference it's going to make for them is they're going to have a brighter future because they're going to have this money coming to them. Wow. So good on uh, Mr. Canoe for actually uh, writing a long-term wrong. Mm -hmm. And as well, it seems that Mr. Canoe, along with the federal government, have made an agreement to uh, put in $20 million each. Oh, wow. Uh, that will go towards the search of the landfill. Where uh, bodies of indigenous women are suspected to have been very unceremoniously dumped mm -hmm. after being murdered. Wow. Um, so, uh, hey, you know, uh, he did say he did not want to become, did not want to be uh, the indigenous premier. He wanted to be the premier for everyone, and I think he has shown that so far. Um, but sure does help when you have an indigenous premier, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes a big difference. They seem to give a damn for some bizarre reason. That was sarcasm, by the way. No. Just making sure everybody understood that. Um, yeah. Mr. Canoe, you go. Well done, sir. Well done. You go. Once again. Well done. That's using your power and your position to do good things. I am very, 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 very happy. And uh, this experience that these kids uh, have gone through is one that I'm familiar with, actually. Um, of course, uh, in my case, it wasn't uh, the, the Children's Aid Society itself, but it was the actual foster home because, you know, I was there during the time of 20-something percent interest rates. Uh, and, yeah, I remember, hey, I'd like to do this. There's no money. Children's Aid doesn't pay for that. Mm. That was like the mantra of my childhood F found out later that children's they did pay for that oh really yeah so what was the excuse 
that was the, the they needed the money. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is also why when I was in a grade 13 and I got accepted to go on that exchange program to Australia mm. for three months, how it all fell apart when uh, our foster family found out that they had to host someone for three months as well. Uh, oh, but we're not getting paid for that. Oh. And we're not getting paid for you while you're gone for three months. Yeah, so that they didn't want me. So you can't go. Yeah. 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 Turns out I could have gone. Mm. Turns out there was money for that. Oh, well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a feeling. Uh, let me just put it this way. When it comes to this particular case, kits and cubs, I might not be the most unbiased relator. That's fine. You, you, know, <laughs> you know what you lived. You have lived experience in that area. Lived experience counts for an awful lot. If you yeah, yeah, but me. cards on the table. For like this, I'm saying this is a good move for Wap Canoe because I know what it feels like to be mm -hmm. one of those kids. So, <laughs> so just letting you know that my curation of that particular bit of news might be colored by a little more than just purely objective and cold, dispassionate analysis. You do with that information what you will, kids and cubs. <laughs> uh, now, Kit Tavi, Kit Tavi G asked, have you ever confronted them with this as an adult? Uh, not my foster parents itself, because on the day I moved out, that's the day that they asked me that I was gay, and I said yes, and they made it clear that they didn't want it, uh, no more contact with me despite the fact that I had lived there for 10 years. So uh, yeah. I have never uh, really talked to them again. And, you know, I aged, I, we're talking about now 30 years ago and more, and I, I've moved on. Yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not really getting old battles. But every now and then something comes up in the news and it prompts that little feeling center right there. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I remember how that feels. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, yeah. right? No, Kit Jim, uh, not all of my foster experience uh, was horrible and not even all with that family. So uh, just so you know, it, it wasn't all bad. It just wasn't all good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, kids and cubs, what else do we have for you before we go? Um, I think, yeah, we might have a little time to uh, go into it. So let's try. Well, um, I got to wrap in 10. Like I, I've got a hard exit in 10 minutes. So, All right. I, like I have to be off the air at, at uh, 8.15. I have okay. uh, things to take care of. Okay. So we'll skip that one. We'll do this one. Uh, if you happen to be living on the West Coast, and if you happen to be living in Van Vancouver, you might have noticed that there's a lot of logging going on in Stanley Park oh. at the moment. And uh, that's because a few years ago, there was a huge looper moth caterpillar infestation. Apparently, if you went into Stanley Park a few years ago, there were clouds of moths. Oh, wow. And uh, they attacked some of the trees there. And it means that about 160,000 trees in Stanley Park are going to need to be cut. Most of them are smaller western hemlocks, but some are 70 to 80 year old trees that are as old as the park. And there haven't been this many trees needed to be cut down in Stanley Park since the really bad windstorm of 2006 that did a number uh, on the park. Uh, it's a matter of public safety um, because Stanley Park is the second largest urban park in North America and the most visited one in Canada with over 18 million visits a year. And they just can't have trees just cracking and falling on people no, that would be uh, so they're taking them down and it's also uh, to uh, manage a uh, long-term fire hazard uh, because we're expecting another warm center summer with lots yes. of wildfires and given that it is an urban park you don't want it to all go up Boom. so um and they're doing it now because they have to do it uh, before bird nesting season because once that happens they can't cut anything down um, there are some environmental groups that are saying that cutting down the trees will actually cause more of a damage because they will leave some debris along the way that will be easier to catch up uh, for fire and will create uh, alleyways of wind uh, for uh, that will feed the fires. Um, I don't have, no, have enough knowledge to know who's right on this one. No idea. Um, so, uh, Any arborists so that's what they want to tell us, please. Yeah, so that's what's going down uh, at the moment. And there uh, will be some replanting of trees that will start uh, next week. Uh, they're starting with 25,000 seedlings. So if you're in, uh, in that area and you notice that there's a lot of uh, chainsaw sounds and all that kind of stuff. That's why. So that's why. That's what's going on. All right, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? 
We do indeed, sir. All right, kits and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you, you, you. Ah. Because sharing is caring, please tell your peeps and poops all about us because word of mouth is priceless and, well, you do advertising for us better than I could ever dream of doing kids and cubs so thank you for everything that you do whenever you retweet an episode and leave a comment with it uh that makes my little beaver heart very 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 happy if you do not want to miss an episode you don't have to not at all because the ray girl has come to your rescue by sponsoring our pod page account that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words or if you happen to be watching you can scan that qr code that's right under my tiny 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 goatee today <laughs> and that will bring you directly there and if you would like to support us in other ways well then you can make like kit elaine and go to our true north eager beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page and smash our buttons. Like, share, subscribe, smash one, smash two, smash three. Have at it. That too makes us happy. And if you would like to support us in other ways, the QR code by Mr. Grizz's head right there will bring you to our coffee page where you can make a donation if you happen to like the quality of our programming and have a little couple of loonies or toonies shaking around in your pocket. You can make a contribution to the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund, which helps to keep this grizzly and this beaver moist. And that way, we can prepare this show that we hope you love and appreciate for you five days a week and with a couple of bonuses here and there thrown in. Mm -hmm. So there you go, kits and cubs. And if you are listening, you go to our coffee page, coffee, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And that's where you can make your contribution. Thank you so much for everything that you do We're coming up to the end of the month. So if you happen to have a little bit extra to help us, uh, do what we do. We are very grateful. And if you don't, that's quite all right. Shares, retreats, and the gift of your attention are very, very important to us and meaningful. If you would like to write from us, write to us, we'd like to hear from you, True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com. Or you can reach us on our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, or our Twitter feed at True Eager. Leave us some, uh, if you're listening on Apple reviews, uh, Apple, sorry, uh, leave us some reviews and leave us some stars. That helps us out a lot as well. From the beaver, because democracy is something that you do. Oops, I've almost forgot. Write those letters, kits and cubs, to your MPs, your MLAs. Uh, check out the Hamilton Helps dot uh, org petition. Um, be interesting to see what happens in Hamilton because apparently there was um, an order uh, issued to evacuate uh, the campers that have grown up to eighty two, I believe, in Camp for Kindness mm. to move them out of the way. So it seems that uh, Kit Angela met with a. Uh, Kit, uh, well, not, not Kit Andrea, sorry, we're not going to call it Kit Andrea, but Kit Andrea met with Andrea Horvath and uh, then had to have a church by uh, outhouses for them and they're being evacuated. So uh, they, it looks like they're really have chosen parking over people here. Mm. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom, please? Remember to breathe. Mm. Remember to breathe. Mm. This too shall pass. Everything is temporary. All right. Mr. Grizzly, as uh, Kit Michael would say, but he can't say today because he's enjoying a well-earned vacation mm. on an island off of Portugal. Lovely. Buddy. Cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. The 
kits for getting a good laugh out of my um whoops no no kit status for you andrea no cereal for you, for you. <laughs> all righty i gotta go i'll see you